Tonight I will be doing a very interesting study. That's right, I did say night. It is nighttime, we are off grid, so the lighting's not the greatest and whatever else, but um, we're going to be talking about something relating to darkness and night, so to speak, and that is death. Um, sermon is called The Baptism of Death. I had a sermon request, somebody requested this that I do this study. What does it mean to think about being baptized for the dead and the baptism of death and whatever else? I'm going to talk about that in this study. And this study is kind of a part two, so to speak, to the thing about you must be born again. Because if you're born again, then that means you had to die. All right. Uh, you can't be born again and keep the old man. The old man has to die. I'll give you a little hint about what this sermon is going to be about. So we're going to start out today and tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So you can turn your King James Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is a very important doctrinal truth about when you get saved, when the Lord saves you, what happens. All right? um, religion can only give you um, rules and things that you have to live by. There's no supernatural anything with Islam or Catholicism or Buddhism or whatever else, name it. Uh, there isn't anything supernatural there. It's all, well, I'm a Hindu now, so I have to put the little red dot on my forehead and I have to do this and I can't eat that and I have to go to, you know, I'm a Catholic now, so I have to go to the Catholic church and go through the confirmation and all this other. See, there's nothing. It's all what you do. It's all what the church tells you to do. When you truly get saved, there's a death involved there. You actually die. Your old man dies. Your whole life changes and then you're born again. And uh, it's the Lord doing it. It's something that you can't fake. A lot of people try to fake being a true Bible-believing Christian, but uh, you, look and you look at their life, there's no new birth. And there's especially, there's no death to the old man. The old man's there still. There's no change from before they got saved to now after their profession of salvation. It's very important. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to be doing chapter 15, the whole thing in this study, so you can put a bookmark there if you want to. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You can see some of my other studies on that. You can believe in vain. Uh, there's Gnostics out there that, that make salvation about what they've done in their mind. I believe, therefore I am. I've, I, I uh, profess my, or pronounce myself to be saved because of what I've believed up here. That's not salvation. That is a, that's imagination. I'll say it that way. Uh, true biblical salvation, something spiritual, something supernatural happens in your life. And we'll see about that in this passage. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Stop there again. Um, what separates the founder of our faith, our religion, from all the others out there? Ours died, was buried, and He rose again the third day. Muhammad didn't rise again. Buddha didn't rise again. All the popes don't rise again. There's a big difference there. Our Savior died, was buried, and He rose again. Verse 6, After that He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that He was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, He was seen of me, also as of one born out of due time. If you've seen my study on the thing of He must be born again, um, a lot of people come out and they say, well, <clears throat> the term born again doesn't appear in the Pauline epistles, so it's technically not for us today in the church age. Uh, that's nonsense. Okay, that's some hyper-dispensational stuff. You have to watch out for it. As of one born out of due time, what does that mean? Uh, it's talking about being born again. Okay, and you can watch my study to get all the scriptures proving that you have to be born again as a Christian today. <clears throat> Verse 9. For I am the least of, all, of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. 
But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Hmm. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Just like all the other religions out there. If Jesus didn't come up from the dead, your faith is vain. <clears throat> Verse 15, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Again, another thing about being born again, when you're born again, your sins are paid for. There's a new life there. There's a new creature. You don't become sinlessly perfect. I'll say it again because so many people lie about me. Denlinger teaches sinless perfection. He teaches that you can't sin after you get saved. I have never taught that. Don't believe that. There's a lot of lies that are spoken about this ministry, and a lot of people just fall for it. They're too lazy to check into it and actually see what I say. I have never taught sinless perfection, ever. What I've taught is that some things change. You live a new life now. All right, verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Yeah, very true. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. In other words, Jesus Christ puts all things under him. doesn't mean the Father, okay? So, because he can't put himself, you know, I mean, he's the same being. Understand, again, I get this thing about me, you know. Old Denlinger teaches that Jesus is the Father. There's no difference between them. Jesus is the same being as God the Father, but he's not the same as God the Father. Please understand that. The body is not the same as the soul. They're two different things. All right, again, another one of the big lies that's taught about me. Brian says that there's, there is no, you know, the Son of God. Jesus is not the Son of God. It's, he's only the Father. I don't teach that. <laughs> All right? So, but the whole point there is there is a specific prophecy given for Jesus Christ that he will rule and reign on the earth for 1,000 years. And he is separate from the Father. The body and the soul are separate until that 1,000 years is complete. Then he delivers up the kingdom to the Father and he says, there. The prophecies are fulfilled. The scripture is fulfilled. There, it's done. And then they become one. All right? The body and the soul have to be separate while work is being done. It's important to understand that. Um, verse 28, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And a lot of, you know, I've seen Trinitarians, they have no idea how to handle that verse. Well, you know, I don't know here. You know, and they just kind of say, well, see, that proves that they're two different beings and that the son kind of comes and he bows before the father or something. No, that's not what he's saying there. It's simply saying that the son comes and says, okay, the work is finished. And the father and the son, the body and the soul, the Jesus being the body, the son being the body, in other words, and the father being the soul come together. All right. You read the book of Revelation, chapter 6, you have the altar there, uh, one of the seals. I think it's the fifth seal, if I remember correctly. And under the altar, John sees souls. And they're saying, how long, you know, Lord, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood upon, which, upon them which be on the earth? That's what he's saying there. You see, the body is separate. Their body is down on the earth, but the soul's up there in heaven. So there's some things going on there. There's separation. Well, it's the same thing with God. Man is made, man, excuse me, man is made after the similitude of God. Okay, uh, 
God is three in one, body, soul, spirit, but one being, one person. That's what the Bible teaches. You will never see persons, plural, in reference to God. Never forget that because that's the big primary tenet of Trinitarianism, that there's three persons. It's not true. There are no three persons with us. If we're made after the similitude of God, how could there be three persons in God but just one person in us? And we have a body, soul, spirit, but somehow God has something different than that. But we're made after his similitude. Just insane. But you see there, the first 28 verses, it's mostly speaking about resurrection. In other words, um, when you get saved, when you're truly born again, you have the promise that you will be resurrected one day. That's mostly what that's talking about. Um, but what's it talking about in terms of having a new life in Jesus Christ? That's what we're going to continue with here. Um, verse 29, and here's where it gets interesting. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Okay, now this is what's interesting here. Baptized for the dead. You say, what kind of weird ceremony? You know, some kind of extreme unction or something in the Catholic Church, you know? Uh, no. Uh, extreme unction is after the person's dead. The priest comes in and does the last rites or whatever and puts a little cross on their on the corpse's bot or you know, forehead or whatever with olive oil or whatever else they use. Holy christening oil. Um, yeah. That's not what it's talking about. Okay. What is it talking about there? What is this thing of um, baptized for the dead? What does that mean? Well, let's go to Romans chapter 6. I'll show, what, show you what it is. Romans chapter 6. And you could read the whole chapter. It's a really good chapter here to, talking about what happens when you get saved, what happens to the old man. But um, we'll see here. Romans chapter 6. Verses 1 through 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You're dead. Verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Huh. Baptized into death there. That's the baptism of death. That's what it's talking about. When you're baptized, you're supposed to be buried under the water, so to speak, and then you come back up as a new creature in Christ Jesus. And, you know, you say, well, I've never had that happen or whatever else. Well, okay, that's symbolic of what takes place when the Lord actually saves you. You don't have to be baptized in water in order to get that. Okay, that's fine. Again, I'm not against baptism. That's fine. You can be baptized. Uh, that's great. But you have to understand it's merely symbolic. The real thing that happens when you are born again is your old man dies and is buried and then you rise again as a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's what it's talking about there. So that's what the term uh, baptized for the dead means. You're baptized for Jesus Christ, for his service. You're now, being, you're, you're now born again. Christ is formed in you. You see, that's what that means, baptized for the dead. Let's continue reading here, verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And you know, these wicked apostates, they'll, well not even apostates, these wicked lost false converts, they'll say, well see it says, should walk in newness of life. <laughs> you don't have to, you just kind of should. You know, it's there and it's kind of optional. You can walk as a new creature in Christ Jesus, but you don't have to. That's not what it's talking about. You will walk in newness of life, but there are times that you will fail the Lord. You will get messed up and the Lord will have to chasten you. Right? That's the should there. If you fall away from it, it's not doesn't mean you're not saved or something. It just means the Lord's going to have to chasten you now. Verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Can you point to a time in your life when your whole life changed? Can you point to a time when in your life when your relatives literally treated you like you died? 
You know, it's ironic, actually. I've read about some uh, things with uh, Judaism and everything else. And if a Jew gets saved, uh, according to a lot of the modern traditions, I can't say that they all do it, the ultra-Orthodox and the Orthodox and the more modern ones. I don't know if they all do this, but there are Jews that if one of their members of the family gets saved, become a Christian, they will actually have a funeral for that relative. And the relative's not invited, obviously. And from that moment on, you've died. You can call up your parents and you can say, uh, Hi, father and mother, how are, how are you? I'm sorry, we don't have a son. He died a few years ago. Click. And they'll hang up the phone. And if you're born again, um, you know for a fact that some of your relatives treat you like there's been a funeral. They don't call. They don't send you cards at the holidays or anything else. You're as good as dead to them. And how about your uh, friends from your past? Yes, that's there too. A lot of friends and they, uh, oh, who's, oh yeah, that guy I used to hang out with him. Yeah, yeah. Something happened to him. I don't know what. I, I lost contact with him. He's dead to me now. Yeah. They can see it. They can see that there's a change. And you say, well, I've never had anything like that. You know, I just, I enjoy life. Everybody likes me. I, I like them and whatever. Then you're a false convert. I can say that without any kind of, uh, well, I don't know. All certainty, if there's never been a point in your life when things changed, when there was that death and the old man's buried, and then you walk as a new creature, if that never happened, then you need to, to really seriously consider asking the Lord to save you. Come to the, to, come to the end of your self-righteousness. Okay? I don't edit videos, by the way, so I apologize if occasionally I get a little tongue-tied or whatever else. Um, but let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 30. <clears throat> okay, it says here, And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. Can you say that as a Christian? That you die daily? As you get older as a Christian, you'll see more things that the Lord has to just kind of prune out of your life. The Bible talks about the, how He takes you and He purges things that you can produce more fruit. We have apple trees on our property here and um, we've pruned those trees. Choke cherry trees and other fruit types of things and whatever else and you, you prune them. You cut the things off, the dead branches, the things that aren't going to produce any fruit. I, that needs to go, this needs to go, that needs to go. Hey Brian, um, that music... I, don't, I really don't approve of that. That needs to go. Oh, okay. Um, I really used to really like it. It does. I don't like it though. Oh, okay. Well, here I'll put it in the trash. All right, Lord. Thank you for that. I'll try to do better. Okay. Yeah. Um. Oh, and hey, by the way, that shirt that you have there, that T-shirt, that logo on there, eh, not really pleasing to me. Let's let's cut that out too. Oh, okay. Throw that out. Oh, and uh, Ryan, those videos over there. Right there? Yeah, I really don't approve of that. Snip, snip, snip. I die daily. Are you experiencing that? Oh no, the Lord doesn't convict me about any sins or anything. I I just kind of do what I want. And, and um, I'm enjoying my salvation. I'm enjoying my Christianity. You know, I found a really good church and nobody judges me there. <laughs> I mean, you know, I prefer to watch videos that are positive, you know, and uh, that don't bring me down and tear me down, and make me kind of depressed, you know. <laughs> okay. Still, deal still uh, dealing with the old corpse there. Um, verse 32. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, he's talking about people there, by the way, if you don't know that, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. You say, what? 
Okay, what is this talking about? I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. What advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications, corrupt good manners. What does that mean? Uh, very simple. You get around your lost family members. You get around your lost former friends. You know what they'll do? Evil communications will corrupt your good manners. They'll try to get you back to the way you were before you died. They'll try to dig up that old man and say, hey, you know, I remember, you know, okay, you're, you're into this Bible stuff. Oh, you know, that's cool. Okay, uh, whatever. I'm, that's nice. I support that. But man, you remember that time we went out to the mall? And we went to the, we, remember that time we saw that movie? Do you remember that that night? And, and you go, well, yeah, I, I can I remember that. Oh, I remember we had that fun and, and we went out and we, you did that joke. Remember that you stood up and did yeah, yeah, I did that. And pretty soon they're starting to draw you back into that. Evil communications corrupt good manners. They want to resurrect the old man. They want to bring it back. And a lot of you write in the comments, well, brother, I was doing good, you know, and I got around with some of my older friends. And mm -hmm. If you're a Christian, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, there's separation from the lost world. You have to be dead to the, that past. And by the way, I just have to say this because I know, you know, I've done this a video here before and people get all upset about this. They say, oh, you're into witchcraft or something because you have this deer skull here. Uh, it was given to me by my older brother when he was in Montana. It's a mule deer and we use it to dry socks. Okay. I would have left the socks there, but I didn't think anybody would really like to see me doing a sermon with you know, dirty socks hanging behind me. So just to explain that. But I thought it'd be a proper, uh, you know, uh, decoration here when we're talking about death. So just had to say that. Um, <clears throat> but what do you do? What do you do if you've messed up and you've gotten back in with the old crowd? What is the solution? Verse 34, awake to righteousness. Oh, just, you know, you can have the righteousness as a lost person and as a buried old man. You can, no, awake, rise from the dead. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Awake to righteousness and, what does it say? Sin, occasionally because none of us are perfect or, you know, we shouldn't really judge each other. No, it says sin not. Well, uh, why would you try to change that? I've said this thing so many times in my sermons, and I'm just going to keep saying it, so you might as, well get, might as well get used to it. All sin is negative. Every single sin that you do, every single sin that's condemned in the Scriptures, every single one hurts you. Why would you want to continue in sin? Sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. You know the way the lost world gets the knowledge of God, brethren? Most of them, they've never even heard of this King James Bible, especially now. Um, they're supposed to get the knowledge of God by watching you and seeing your changed life. They're supposed to see that you're different than the other people out there. And they watch you and they study you and they say, okay, I've seen Muslims and, oh, it's, you know... They, okay, it's called a prayer and they get down on their knees and they go, la, 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 or whatever they do, the thing. Uh, yeah, and then they see that Muslim, a holy Muslim, you know, I will not eat pork. I don't do this other stuff. I pray to Allah. Uh, and then the guy uses profanity. And he's a pervert, just like any other lost man. And oh, here's a Catholic. And oh, holy, holy Mary, Mother of Grace, put the ash on my forehead, oh, walking around and everything. And then you see him sometime and he's out there telling dirty jokes just like other lost people. I've seen it. I've seen some of the most sanctified holy Catholics and just like that, they'll just flip and start using profanity. They'll cuss like any sailor, any lost man or woman out there. And just go down through the list. And all the Protestant churches too. I've known of Baptist preachers that uh, behind the pulpit, oh, they're preaching about the love of the Lord and oh, the word of God. Brother, we have to, you know, live our lives by the word of God. You know, and then you get in private with them and it, hey, you ever hear the joke about, you know. Oh, 
Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. I'd like to talk to you today about the Bible. Hold on, let me just put the... I'm going to have this thing done. Okay, let me put that, just stop that out. Okay, what I was saying is I'd like to talk to you about the Bible... Really? Hey, buddy, let me tell you about the Lord. I'm almost done with my beer. Just hold on a second. But all that stuff's okay. All, that, all those things are okay for a Christian to mess with. It doesn't affect my salvation. Oh, I think it does. I think it really does. There's supposed to be death there. You understand? I understand people struggle. But if you say that to me that you've been saved for 20, 30 years and you're still struggling with something that you were doing before you got saved, I have serious doubts about you. Very serious doubts about you. There needs to be a new birth. And it's not you doing it. It's not, well, I've done all these good things to clean up my life and whatever. No, it's the Lord that does it in your life. And if I don't see it, you scare me. Let's continue here. Verse 35. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. Get a hold of that. What you sow, if you sow to the flesh, you will to the flesh reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you will to the spirit reap life everlasting. Galatians chapter 6 talks about that. That which thou sowest is not quickened, when you're quickened, that's the Holy Spirit moves in. You're now quickened. That's, that, which, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. If there's no death there, if there's no time when your life ended as a lost person, if that death isn't there, then you're not saved. That's what it's saying. You can't be quickened. You can't be born again, except you die. You have to die first. Verse 37, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. God is the one that does the changing in your life. God says, okay, the body here needs different parts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about that. And different gifts according to the different parts of the body. Some preachers, some teachers, some evangelists, some you know, have the gifts of this or the gift of that. God is the one that does this stuff in your life. God will work with talents God that you have. God will work with desires of your heart, certainly. But God will choose you, and then he will put you into service. And he will say, okay, boom, you're dead. Now I'm going to raise you from the dead. Now, you're going to be wheat for me. Oh, you're going to actually be uh, whatever other grain. I'm going to send you here, and I'm going to go there, and I want you to plant other seeds. Verse 39, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in power. See, we're back to the resurrection now. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Again, this is talking about eternity now. Right now, you're looking at the natural body of Brian Denlinger. This is not what you're going to see in heaven. It's going to look different than that. All right? Your body is going to be different when you get to heaven. Verse 45, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. 
And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, Adam, corruptible flesh, in other words, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We're going to be like Jesus Christ, conformed to the image of Christ. Pretty amazing. <clears throat> Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of sin, the sting of death is sin, and the strength, <clears throat> the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. All right, um, there's eternal security there to somebody who's genuinely born again. All right, your work, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What you do in this life you will be rewarded in the next one. Um, <clears throat> so you see, the resurrection of the dead, the baptism of death, so to speak here, um, it works in two ways. Uh, first and foremost, what you read there in the first part of 1 Corinthians and then in the last part of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, is you have the resurrection of the dead in terms of eternally. Um, I'm not going to just die all of a sudden and then that's it. There's no future for me. There's no heaven or anything else. No, um, I'm going to live forever in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to get a new body that's incorruptible. Um, can't wait for that day. But the Lord gives you a little taste of it down here on this earth. And that is when you truly get saved, when you are truly born again, and the Holy Spirit of God moves into you, when you are quickened, that which is quickened, or it's not, you're not quickened except you die. Paraphrasing there what we read earlier. Quickening happens only after you die. So when you get saved, the old man is buried. And now the Lord raises you from the dead and then he says, okay, now I'm going to do something with your life. It's his decision to make. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, again, a very important part of the thing of the new birth. And uh, I, I really do worry for people because I've met some very nice people, very nice people, and they'll say great things. They'll see the bumper magnets on my car and, or my truck or whatever, and they'll say, um, hey, praise Lord, that's great. I really like your bumper magnets there. And I'll say, are you saved? And uh, yes, I am. I say, are you born again? Are you born again Christian? And they kind of hesitate and they say, yes, I'm a born again Christian. I go to such and such Baptist church. And I think, oh, okay, um, you know, so what's the difference? Well, see, before I got saved, um, I didn't go to church. And then after I got saved, I started going to church. Oh, so uh, the church is the new birth? Now that you go to church, it's, that means that you're born again? Uh, what about the lost people that go to church? Are they born again? Um, I think Muslims go to temples. I think Catholics go to cathedrals and churches and whatever else. Um, don't Hindus go to shrines and, and Buddhists go to shrines and things and um, all the other people? Don't they have holy holy uh, buildings too? Oh, yeah, but, you know, I wear a suit and tie now. I'm clean cut. You know, I, I uh, don't have a scruffy beard like you do, down there. You're not quite as good as me. And, uh, <clears throat> I mean, really, I mean, preaching a sermon with a flannel shirt and, you know, red suspenders. Where's your sense of style? Where's your suit and tie at? I don't know. You might not be born again, Brian. Uh, no, I can assure you I'm born again. <laughs> I know that is a fact because I can look back and I can see when the old man died. I'm not the same man anymore. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. And uh, this life that I live, the preaching and things that I do, wasn't my choice. Um, when I got out of high school, I wanted to be a motorcycle uh, racer slash mechanic. And I actually got training to be a, I'm a certified motorcycle repair technician. One of my favorite things to say. <laughs> uh, I wanted to be a motorcycle mechanic. 
Uh, Lord said no. Um, then I wanted to be a wood turner, professional wood turner. Lord said no. I want to be a logger. Lord said no. What am I supposed to do? Lord said, oh, I have some plans. And here I am. Um, wasn't my choice. There's a lot of things I'd much rather be doing. You know, going to art shows and actually having people saying that my work is beautiful and you're wonderful and you're very talented, you know, young man and all, all of that. And uh, rather than having uh, videos made and websites dedicated to hating me and just trying to destroy my character and whatever else. Uh, yeah, what a choice. <laughs> um, but here I am. Why? Uh, well, because Brian Denlinger that wanted to be all of those different things, mechanic, uh, racer, uh, wood turner, logger, whatever, uh, he died. And he was buried. And uh, there was a good amount of people attended that funeral. And um, those people don't want anything to do with me anymore. The new man that came up out of the uh, dirt there, the new man that came up, they look at him and they say, uh, he's weird. He's a nut. Uh, he's, he's, uh, it used to be I was part of a cult. Now I'm actually a leader of a cult. So, you know, <laughs> I've, I've come pretty far now. Um, you know, so, but that's what they think of me. Um, had a family member recently say my beliefs are King James Ver or King James only garbage. Thank you. Um, I remember years ago when I was first getting into the ministry when my uh, grandmother was still alive and took this big list of people that I've reached, you know, different countries and people posting comments and things and saying how the Lord has used me to change their life. And, and I was just so happy about it. Showed my uh, <clears throat> Christian grandmother and she went, mm. uh, wouldn't you be happy? for me. Then she went on to talk about my cousin, a uh, lost new ager, and now that she's so proud of her because they just bought this brand new house and they just got an Audi car and all these other wonderful things. Oh, okay. Uh, somebody that rejects Jesus Christ, that don't talk to me about Jesus. And then you have the other grandson and um, wants to talk to people about Jesus and spread the word and preach, reaching people in a whole lot of different countries. Hmm, sorry. What's the problem? Um, she's aware of the baptism of death that happened in my life. And she wanted the old man back. The old Brian. Sorry, Grandma. He's dead. And he's not coming back. The new one's here. I trust that you've gone through that, brethren. Um, and it's hard. I know. I know it's hard. If you're out there and you're going through this thing and you're just newly saved and all of a sudden you're seeing everybody, you know, coming to your funeral and they're standing around the casket looking down, symbolically obviously, and they're looking down and they're saying, boy, she sure was fun. What's she into now? This King James stuff? Oh, brother. That's a shame. Oh, that's a shame. Boy, I liked her. She was a lot of fun. Well, that guy there, Remember, we used to have a lot of fun together. Boy, we used to go out to hang out and, and uh, well, we used to play those, shoot them, you know, video games, Medal of Honor or whatever other games that are out there nowadays. Boy, we had fun. Now all he wants to do is read the Bible. I miss that old guy there. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's your wife. Can't you go back to the way you used to be? I miss the old... Uh, way that you were. Sorry, I've experienced the baptism of death. I can't come back. Say goodbye to the old man because he's dead, he's buried, and he won't ever return. That's going to be it for this study, brethren. Um, stay strong in the Lord. Um, and don't get around the uh, evil communications because it will corrupt your good manners. Um, if you have friends that don't uh, want to hear your witness, then get away from them. If you have family that uh, they all they want to do is try to resurrect the old man, get away from them.
do whatever you can. You say, well, I can't right now. I'm in, in, st stuck in my parents' home or whatever else. I understand. There are those situations like that. Marriage. Well, we can't. I can't get out away from them right now. It'd be a divorce and it'd mess up our children and whatever. I get it. But uh, pray about it. Pray long and hard about it. Um, because if you stick around the lost, they'll try to corrupt your good manners. And they'll get you messing around with sin. And ultimately rob you of blessings and rewards at the judgment seat of Christ that you have coming. If you serve the Lord with your life. Think about that. Um, so that will be it. We will see you in upcoming videos. And as always, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support of this ministry.